Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. St. Luke writes, Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. Amen. As I was thinking about our lectionary texts this week, I struggled with our gospel text. I didn't like the idea of comparing God to the unjust judge who only gives the widow what she wants because the judge is tired of being bothered, which then led me down the path that perhaps God's mind can be changed with enough persistence, even if what I want isn't what is best for me. Then after doing some more digging, I started thinking about God as the widow, who is persistent in carrying out justice, which did sit a little bit better in my mind, but at the end of the week, I decided to forgo our gospel text and focus on our reading from Genesis instead. The story of Jacob, who in our text today receives a new name and becomes Israel, has always been an interesting one for me, and it is through his lineage that the Israelites get their name. After all, we aren't named after Abraham or Isaac. Our lineage, our history, is the Israelite history. They are the chosen people of God. Their history is our history. So let's back up in Jacob's story to see what brought us to today's text. Abram, before he became Abraham, received a blessing and a promise from God that one day his descendants would be as vast as the grains of sand on the shore or as countless as the stars in the sky that through him and Sarah a great nation would be born. Interesting to note that in both of these stories, Abraham's and Jacob's, that each received a new name along with their blessing. So we continue forward in the timeline. Abraham received the promise. Abraham and Hagar bore Ishmael. And although that was a descendant of Abraham who would launch another faith and create more descendants, that wasn't the exact promise God had in mind when he blessed Abraham. So we continue in our story and find that through Sarah, Isaac was born, and so God's promise continues. Isaac grew and wed Jacob, or wed Rebecca. The two of them bore Esau and Jacob. Still not the entire great nation God promised, but the beginning of that nation. And here's where Jacob's story begins. Straight from the womb, Jacob is a trickster, a deceiver a person who enjoys playing a prank in order to get what he wants. When Rebekah gave birth to Esau and Jacob, Esau stuck his fist out. The midwife tied a cord around the wrist to show who was born first, and then out popped Jacob without a cord. So Esau was the older twin, which means he would inherit his father's blessing, as was custom. As the twins grew, Esau was a hunter and Isaac's beloved son. Meanwhile, Jacob was more timid, cunning and clung to Rebekah. And when it came time to give of the blessings, Jacob tricked Isaac into giving him the blessing of the firstborn. When Esau and Isaac realized what had happened, it was too late. Jacob had received the blessing, and there is typically only one blessing to give. Jacob received this blessing through deceit, but the blessing counted nonetheless. Jacob fled for his life from the wrath of Esau, which brings our timeline one step closer to today's lesson. Jacob fled, and while he was on the lamb, he met Laban and married both of Laban's daughters, Leah and Rachel. Meanwhile, as he lived in Laban's country with his wives, Jacob was once again up to his trickster ways. 
He tricked Laban out of his sheep by making a deal that only the speckled and spotted sheep would be Jacob's. And sure enough, through Jacob's cunningness, all the sheep born were both speckled and or spotted. Finally, Laban started getting upset, and once again, Jacob had to flee for his life. Are you starting to notice a pattern here? This time, Jacob fled with his two wives, two female slaves, 11 children. Remember the promise from God? The 12 tribes of Israel would one day come from Jacob. And all of his flocks and herds and everything else he had acquired while living in Laban's country. And this time, he is fleeing from Laban, which will bring him back into close proximity to Esau, which Jacob still believes Esau wants to kill him. So Jacob once again falls back on his deceiving nature, separates his camp into two smaller entourages. He sends them on ahead of him across the river. This way, if Esau attacks, perhaps he will attack the wrong camp or something of that nature. Jacob's family and possession cross the river, and Jacob stays on the other side and spends the night alone. During the night, a man, we assume an angel and or God, comes upon him and they wrestle. They wrestle through the entire evening until daybreak. The unnamed man realizes that he wasn't necessarily going to win this wrestling match, so he struck Jacob on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint. The man asks that Jacob let him go because the sun is about to rise. Jacob, being as brazen as he is, demands a blessing from this man. So regardless if this unnamed man is God, an angel, or simply a man, Jacob sensed enough to demand a blessing. Jacob knew that whoever he was wrestling with would be able to give him what he was looking for. And once again, through the process of blessing, we see a renaming. Jacob's name will no longer be Jacob, but instead will be Israel, the name that Abraham's promised descendants will carry with them forever. Our passage this morning ends with Jacob, now christened Israel, limping past Penuel. So why is this text in our canon? Outside of the fact that the Israelites are named after this strange character in our Bible, why depict a wrestling match between God and Jacob? This text is important for the simple fact that Jacob, Israel, the founder of God's chosen people, wrestled with God, and in this particular case seemed to win that match. As human beings, we are very similar to Jacob and the Israelites. We look out for ourselves, choosing to trick and deceive others to further our cause, and we are constantly wrestling with God in a myriad of different ways. Wrestling. Now, we all know I don't really do sports, but I do know enough of wrestling that it requires stealth, tricking your way around your opponents, fainting in and out of reach until finally one of you wins. I think that's about it. Although I don't know much about wrestling, I do own a dog, and I have watched a ton of dogs wrestle at the dog park. And as dogs wrestle, there's a give and take, a bouncing around, a back and forth, as each dog tries to figure out how to get the best of the other. And as Jacob and the unnamed man wrestled, I wonder if it looked similar, each circling the other, <clears throat> waiting to find the opportunity to strike, each equally matched, that until the unnamed man struck Jacob on the hip, he wasn't sure if he was going to win. We each engage in our own wrestling matches, day in and day out. We may not always be physically wrestling something, but we wrestle emotionally and mentally. We wrestle with ourselves, our families, our friends, and God. We go in and out of conversations, trying to worm our way through the world, using deception and trickery when we need to, all to further our own cause. We are named after the Israelites who were great at wrestling, just like their forefather, Jacob. The Israelites, as they wandered in the desert, constantly wrestled with God, Moses, and Aaron. The Israelites would cry out to God, draw closer to God, and then once God granted them favor, off they would go again in their own direction, similar to wrestlers in the ring. And unfortunately, I don't think we have come far from the Israelites. We still wrestle with God most of the time, sometimes for our own personal gain, and sometimes because we are stubborn human beings who don't always know what is best for ourselves. One of the ways we spend time wrestling with God, I think, is over where our lives are going to go. God knows what is best for each of God's children, 
Yet we believe we know what is best for our own lives. So we argue and wrestle and avoid the still, small voice of God that whispers in our hearts, giving us our true calling, showing us our gifts, telling us how to help the world. Instead, we turn up the noise of the world in order to ignore God's calling on our life, and on we go. Round one goes to the human. And then, the, and then for the human, life gets harder. Our jobs get worse. Life becomes less fun. The pay raises don't come in as expected. Property taxes go up. You name it. Meanwhile, the whispering in your heart continues to say you are destined for something better. Take the leap. Let go of the wrestling match you're engaged in, and I will provide your every need, God says. Instead, we turn up the noise in the world. We dig our heels in. We try harder. We move faster. We sleep and eat less. We can somehow do it all. Round two goes to the human. And then, then our lives continue to fall apart. We realize we are in a situation we can't find our way out of. Not sure how we got in, but we definitely can't find our way out. We surrender. We finally listen to the still, small voice. We quit our job. We start the new adventure that God has prepared for us. Because God has prepared the way. The perfect job opening, the perfect house, a place to use our gifts. We realize that God has always wanted good and perfect things for us. Life gets easier. You can breathe again. Round three, and the match goes to God. We find ourselves in wrestling matches with the king of the universe. What I find fascinating in this imagery is that God lets us win, at least for a while. The creator of the world could wipe each and every one of us out in the blink of an eye. But if we are thinking logically, there is no way we could win that wrestling match. I am fairly certain I couldn't win a, re a wrestling match against another human being, let alone God. Yet so often we do, or at least we think we win. We wrestle with God about so many things, what we do with our lives, why do good things happen to bad people, why do bad things happen to good people, what happens after we die, do our beloved pets go to heaven, why do children get sick, why cancer. Jacob wrestled with God and he won. Jacob walked or limped away from his wrestling match with a blessing, a new name, a promise. I can't imagine a better outcome. There are two final things in this story that I want us to remember. The first is that Jacob wrestles with God at night, and that's when we do most of our wrestling too. Have you ever noticed that your problems seem way bigger in the darkness of the night? There is a reason children are afraid of the dark. No monsters lurk under that bed during the day, but the minute the lights go off, monsters galore. For me, everything is way worse in the dark. I deal with migraines often, and when I get one in the middle of the night, it is always way worse than if I get one in the middle of the day. What should technically just be a migraine all of a sudden becomes a stroke, a tumor, an aneurysm. You name it, I've probably diagnosed myself with it. I also need to stay off the internet. But in the light of the day when I am thinking logically, a migraine is just that, a migraine, nothing worse a treatable migraine. The dark doesn't have to be the physical dark after sundown. The night can just mean any time we aren't thinking clearly, any time when we don't have all the information. Just like the wilderness for the Israelites, the night for us is the time when we aren't clear about what is going on. When we choose to engage wrestling matches with God in the dark, we are bound to not only lose, but to come away injured. But the good news in the middle of our dark nights is that the dawn will come. Light will always break through the darkness. Either the sun will physically rise, or our darkness will metaphorically lift. The darkness will not linger forever. The wrestling match will end, but with the daybreak comes change. Jacob left the wrestling match with God with an injured hip. For the rest of Jacob's life, he walked with a limp. Sure, he wrestled with God and won, but he also came away physically changed. I can honestly say I have never physically been harmed after a wrestling match with God, but I have come away injured. My ego has been bruised, my thoughts a bit battered, my once held dear thoughts shattered. And although those injuries can hurt, it can also cause growth. I've wrestled with God, I've won from time to time, I've lost the majority of the time.
but every time I engage in a wrestling match with God, I have come away changed. Jacob was changed after his wrestling match with God, both physically and mentally. He had a limp, and his name was changed. When we choose to engage our omnipotent God in a wrestling match, be prepared to be changed. My prayer for you this week is that as you engage in your wrestling matches, whatever they may be, that you come away changed for the better. God loves you. God will let you win. But perhaps we should be more open to why we engage in wrestling matches with God in the first place. Amen.